brought to you by Head Start Basketball. Hey, hoop heads, wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. We've had their partnership manager and training specialist Jefferson Mason and marketing manager Nick Bartlett on the show in the past, and we couldn't be more excited about what they're doing for the game of basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market and truly accelerate skill development faster than ever. Beyond efficient reps, Dr. Dish provides training expertise and versatility designed to develop complete players. The new Dr. Dish CT machine has further revolutionized basketball training with over 150 plus on-demand individual and team workouts from some of the best coaches and trainers in the game. These workouts include video instruction and combine game-like shooting drills with ball handling, conditioning, and agility drills. Along with workouts, the Dr. Dish Training Management System also provides stat tracking and analytics to track progress and ensure accountability. These are just a few reasons why top programs like Duke, North Carolina, Louisville, Florida, Baylor, and countless others are upgrading to Dr. Dish. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com. Follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. And make sure you mention the Hoop Heads podcast to get $300 off your next Dr. Dish purchase. That's a great deal, Hoop Heads. Get out and get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. I don't look at it as I created them or I made them or I even improved their game. I look at it as I was blessed that they gave me the opportunity to work with them. I had the opportunity to work with some elite guys and really get an understanding of training modalities. Justin Brantley is the Ohio and Midwest recruiting coordinator for the All Ohio basketball program that competes on the Nike EYBL circuit and the executive recruiting and basketball operations consultant for COA Prep in Bethesda, Maryland. Justin has spent the last decade cultivating, developing, and marketing student athletes, athletic programs, and corporations of all sizes. Justin served as the Academy Director at Spire Institute in Geneva, Ohio, helping to create one of the most popular and recognizable brands in high school basketball. Prior to his tenure at Spire, Brantley served as the National Scouting Director at NCSA Athletic Recruiting, where he assisted thousands of families in navigating the recruiting process. As a high school athlete at St. Martin de Porres High School in Detroit, Michigan, Justin utilized the sport of football to earn his education at the University of Illinois and Howard University. After a brief stint in professional football, he transitioned to coaching and student-athlete development and began working with athletes from youth to the professional levels. As the Hoopheads podcast audience grows week by week, your five-star ratings and reviews help fuel our growth. Please subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast app. When you do, the latest episodes will hit your phone as soon as they drop. Let a friend or coaching colleague know about the show and join the thousands of others who have become a part of Hoopheads Nation. Be prepared to listen and learn from our conversation with Justin Brantley from COA Prep and All Ohio Basketball. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Lindsay here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. And tonight we are pleased to welcome to the podcast from All Ohio Basketball and COA Prep, Justin Brantley. Justin, welcome. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to, to talk some basketball. Uh, it seems like that's what I do 99% of my time is, is talk basketball. So uh, excited to be able to do it more in a, in a formal setting and, and um, hopefully educate some listeners a little bit. So excited to be here. Absolutely. We're excited to be able to dig into your diverse sports and basketball background. You've got, done a lot of interesting things that I think our audience is going to be very excited to hear uh, about some of the things that you have to share and just talk about your experience and how that can help some of our audience out there to be better at what they do. So let's begin by going back, just giving people an idea of your athletic background, just so they have an idea of your history. Talk a little bit about your sports background as a kid and, and what you did as an athlete when you were younger. Okay, yeah, absolutely. So um, as a kid, there was never a season that I wasn't involved in something. Um, my parents started me out with hockey and soccer when I was two years old. Um, hockey was my go-to sport. Um, I played at the uh, you know, the travel level all the way all the way through middle school um, and, and the beginning phases of high school, but uh, really just had a love for basketball. I wanted to play football. I played soccer, as I stated. So um, at, at some point in time throughout all of those years, um, 
I was pretty serious about all of, all of the above. Um, you know, I, I played at soccer. I had Division One scholarship offers uh, in soccer. Hockey, I let go of uh, my freshman year to focus on basketball and football. Um, basketball, you know, I, I hit that, that awkward phase where, you know, I didn't quite grow and as a 5'9 guard, no matter how much I love the game. Um, <laughs> yep. there, just, there just weren't a, a ton of opportunities. Um, but football ended up being kind of that um, – you know that that sweet spot of development, and you know I ended up, you know I played at I played at St. Martin Porth High School uh, in Detroit, Michigan, and you know we were uh, a powerhouse um, in football, basketball, and track. You know we if we didn't win the state championship every year, we were in contention for it. So um, I had a state championship on on the football field. Uh, I had a lot of positive things going there, which led me to to continue my career and continue my education uh, at the University of Illinois and. It was always, you know, from a football standpoint, it was almost like I, I knew that um, as a job, kind of, you know, like I knew before I got to that professional phase that this is like work, you know, this is a job, this is something that I'm doing to earn my education, this is something that, you know, I have to do, where basketball is always that thing I get to do, right? So, you know, in the off season, I'd, I'd go, you know, hoop as much as I could, or you know, I joined um, the intramural squad, and I played against the, the players, and, you know, I was at Illinois at the time of Luther Head and Deron Williams and Dee Brown and, um, you know, a lot of just amazing guys to be around and, you know, being able to play with these guys and hang out and still talk basketball because that ultimately was, you know, where my passion lied. Um, and uh, during my, my sophomore year, our, our head coach, Ron Turner, um, was relieved of duties. They brought in Ron Zook. Um, his, his philosophy was a little bit different than a lot of our philosophies. And, you know, the coach that recruited me wasn't there anymore. And I, you know, I ended up transferring to Howard University in, in Washington, D.C., and finished my career there, finished my education there, um, and, you know, really just was blessed to be able to to play a, a sport in college, was blessed to be able to, uh, to continue my athletic career beyond high school. Um, and for me, it was just kind of figuring out what my identity was beyond sports. So you know, I went to training camp with the Washington Redskins in 2006. I went undrafted. Um, but I was uh, I, pl I played in the college all star game, so I had a great college career, and, and just to me it was like the natural progression, right? Like, okay, you played. That was a four year varsity starter. Okay, next thing you know, hey, you're playing in college. You know, it was like the next step is I'm going to be in the NFL. There was no, sure. th there was no, you know, ifs about there no, it. There right? was no doubt, right? It was just the next. It was just what was going to happen. Right, right. And, and when that didn't happen, um, there was a whole lot of confusion, right? Like. You know, where did I fail at? You know, what did I do wrong? Like, what is wrong with me? And, you know, it took me until um, you know, about four or five years later, you know, 25, 26, when I, I took a, a look back and said, wait a minute, you know, I got an opportunity. You know, less than 3% of guys go on to play Division One, you know, college uh, football. And I had an opportunity to do that twice, right? I did it at two different schools. Um, I have records that still stand to this day at Howard University, you know. So I was blessed, and I was looking at it as, you know, the opposite end of the spectrum. When re in reality, um, really, I had an amazing opportunity and an amazing experience that not everybody gets to enjoy. So um, it, it was just kind of changing my perspective on what that looked like and what that what that was, uh, and then figuring out, okay, what is it that that God wanted to teach me with this, right? What what am I called to do, right? So um, to me. Here I am telling God what my plans are, but what, what plans did he have for my life? Like, what did that look like? And it ended up turning into training and coaching. Um, and, you know, I, I started coaching um, almost immediately. I started training. I was 21 years old. Um, and, you know, I, I've all, I'd always loved strength conditioning. I'd always loved player development. And I was literally training out of the trunk of my car. Um, so, you know, I would have, you know, I have my agility ladder, my hurdles, my cones. And, you know, I would sit back and I would study guys, um, you know, and, and it's funny, like I would study Alan Stein, who I just had a conversation with last week. And I know you guys talked to him not yep. too long ago. Um, and, and we're going to be work, doing some, some things together in the future. But um, I would literally study Alan Stein and, uh, and, and some of the other top trainers and I would watch things and I would you know, see different ways to do things. And, and I would take that and I would apply it uh, to getting my athletes better. And I had some pretty amazing guys. Um, I, you know, I was working with Derek Walton when he was in high school. I was working with A.J. Turner, who's currently playing for Northwestern. You know, I got an opportunity to work with Josh Jackson. I got an opportunity to work with, 
you know, Dominic Pointer, who's uh, on the can charge right now um, uh, in, in the Cavs organization. Um, and, and the list goes on and on and on. And I just had an opportunity to really work with some guys young, uh, work with some guys, you know, early in their careers. And I look back on it, and a lot of times people say, well, Justin, we didn't even know you, you worked with these guys. And I, I look at it a little differently, right? Like, I don't look at it as I created them or I made them or I even improved their game. I look at it as, you know, I was blessed that they gave me the opportunity to work with them, right? Like, I had the opportunity to work with some elite guys and really get an understanding of training modalities and transfer of trainness. And I say that all the time, like, guys want to train, and it's like, okay, we're going to do you know, these, these 45 cone, drill, uh, cone drills. And it's like, okay, well, you know, unfortunately, when you get in the game, the cone moves. So <laughs> how is that beneficial to right, trans- transferring that onto the court? So just constantly trying to, to evolve and figure out a way to be a better trainer. Uh, and I worked with guys across all sports. Uh, and, you know, along the, the journey of that, I ended up identifying that I had a passion in recruiting, um, had a passion in seeing my guys get that college opportunity and, you know, wanting to see them go further with it than I did. Um, you know, it, it's kind of my mantra and people always ask me, you know, what's, I, I, I'm super um, in, in intertwined with the idea of balloons. I look at all, the, all of my clients and all my athletes as balloons and you know for me my career you know i held on to it so tight and it's like you know you get that helium balloon and, and you're, you're grasping onto it and you know some guys they want to hold these players so close to them right or they want to hey that's my guy that's my guy he, he can't train with anybody else he can only train with me well if that other guy's a little bit better you might want to let him go right right exactly and for me i look at it as you know being that little kid you get that balloon and you know, you, you want to hold on to it because it's yours and, and you absolutely love it. And you're like, OK, this is my balloon. But you also want to let it go and see how far it can fly and, and be able to watch it reach its highest peak. And that's kind of, you know, the greatest joy for me working on the back end is being able to prepare these guys for the next level and then being able to watch them fly and say, OK, hey, at one point in time, that was my balloon. Right. Like he, he was with me. And now, you know, somebody else took him that much further and that much further and that much further. And. That's kind of been um, for the last the last ten years or so. My passion has been on the recruiting side um, and getting out of the training and skill development world, which I still jump in, you know, where I need to. Um, if I have a player that you know just really needs something, and I, I see it and I see it, and, and, and I'm called to okay, let me step in and see how I can help him. Um, I still do some on the court work, um, but for the most part, I work on the recruiting side, uh, both you know finding talent and identifying talent um, and. and you know, then from there, you know, getting them to that next level, whether it be college, professional, whatever the case may be. So that's kind of in a nutshell, or, or in a in a um, in a short uh, a short you know synopsis. That that's what I do, um, and, and I, I love every moment of it. All right, so I want to jump back and ask you two things. First thing is, you went through and talked about all of your childhood experiences in in a variety of sports. So I want to talk on a topic that we've touched on here on the podcast a bunch of times, but I think it's important to get your perspective on it. And that is talk to me about how important it was for you to be a multi-sport athlete as a kid and why you think that was beneficial ultimately to, again, let's just say you went further in football than anything else. So why was being a multi-sport athlete beneficial to you as someone who ended up playing collegiate football? Yeah. So, I mean, for me, it was, and I'll tell you, just like I tell every athlete I work with, um, it was important for a couple of different reasons. Number one, competition never ended, right? And, you know, having to, you see these guys, and in basketball, not so much because it's pretty much year-round nowadays, um, but with a lot of other sports, um, and even at the younger stages of basketball, it's not as much of year-round. Uh, so you see these guys turning on and off the competition dial, right? Like, okay, let me turn it up. Okay, it's game day. Let me let me crank it up today, but now we're in the off-season. Um, and a lot of high school a lot of high school programs don't have that level of off-season training for it to really be worthwhile for a, a student athlete to to specialize as we call it now depending on the sport there's different conversations to be had right if you're a swimmer you better be specialized you know for sure um you know if you're a gymnast you better be specialized if you're a golfer yeah you probably want to be specialized uh but you know depending on the sport and i think that nowadays um you know i think that you can argue it either way 
Um, I think the training has gotten so much better and, and parents have gotten much more, um, much more aware of what needs to be done if their kid wants to play at the highest level. So, you know, it's hard to tell a, a parent or a kid that absolutely loves baseball, hey, you should probably go play football because that parent's looking at it like, look, the throwing motion is completely different. You know, back in the day, quarterbacks also pitched here and there. But, you know, if you look at it, that throws off their, you know, that throws off their, their curveball. That throws off their, their fastball or, you know, whatever the case may be. So it's hard to argue it either way. But for me, it was more of a competition thing. And, and I love seeing kids that just want to compete. When I'm recruiting a kid, um, I love seeing a kid that, you know, is also, you know, hey, I want to play football or I want to run track or I want to, you know, it's just something about, a kid that is a, is a winner um, and, and a competitor for me. And I'm biased in that, but that's just for me what I look for. And it helped me not to get burned out, right? You know, I because I played so many different sports, it was never a moment where I was like, you know what, I just don't want to do this because there were so many different things and so much variety in my life um, and, and so many different groupings of friends, right? I had friends that didn't play basketball, but they played football. And I had you know, completely different, you know, demographic of friends that I played hockey with and a completely different demographic of friends I played soccer with. So, you know, I was constantly around different groups of people um, and learning from different groups of people and learning from different coaches and different styles. And, uh, and it ultimately made me more successful at this phase of my career because, you know, in, in my history, I have worked in other sports other than just football and basketball. You know, I was national scouting director at NCSA um, and I was able to not just be pigeonholed in, in, you know, your revenue generating sports, but I was able also to work in the Olympic sports side and, you know, work with the soccer players and the hockey players and, you know, the baseball players and the golfers because I had experienced all those different things. So it made me a little bit more marketable um, when it came to growth within the, the professional side of my career. Um, you know, when I was at, when I was at Spire, um, I was able to, to recruit student athletes for our track program or recruit student athletes for our swimming program because it, it wasn't foreign to me and the concepts of it and, you know, what those families were looking to achieve and how they were looking to achieve it. It wasn't, you know, just this foreign concept to me because I, my, my life had existed only in, in between the lines of a, of a, a basketball court or a football field. So for me, it just, the, it, it made me very diverse and, and kind of put me in a position where, um, I could talk all things, um, but I, I look at it and it's also made me kind of be a little bit more open-minded, you know, with my, with my children, you know, I'm, I'm one of those dads. It's like, Hey, do whatever you want to do. I don't care. You know, just cause, just cause I play football at a high level doesn't mean my son, you know, my 13 year olds never strapped the pads on. So, yep. um, for, for me, it's just been a different, you know, a different lens to see things through. Um, and, and I love multi-sport guys. So how do you, uh, this is a question that just out of my own curiosity more than anything else. So do you find it or have you found it at all difficult with your son when you think about the sports that you like the best? And have you found it, do you find it difficult even though you know what some of the dangers are and some of the pratfalls are of pushing your kid too fast too soon or saying, hey, you've got to be a football player or hey, in my case, as a basketball guy, I have to find myself being very deliberate and very careful about what I push on my kids. And to your point, I think after you become a parent, you realize that your kids are going to like what they like, regardless of what it is that you like. Now, you might expose them more. My kids, for example, get much more exposure to basketball probably than they do from other sports, simply because I'm constantly involved in the game. But ultimately, they make their decisions about where they're going to go and what they're going to do. And I think I guess my question to you is, do you ever find yourself having to dial yourself back when it comes to getting your kids involved in athletics with, with as important as sports and athletics has been to you and your career? Yeah, you know what? Um, ironically, no. And, and the reason being, um, when, when my 13-year-old, when, when he was born, um, I, I was 21 years old. I was, you know, and, and maybe this is a little deeper than, uh, than, than, than the podcast calls for today, but, you know, I was, I was navigating through depression uh, from my career ending. Um, you know, I, I was, you know, I had self, um, you know, self-identified myself as an athlete from day one, right? For like sure. There was yep. never anything other than that that I was. 
So for the competitive side of that to end and end as abruptly as it did, there was no like, you know, retirement party. There was no like cooling down period. There was, hey, you're at training camp with the Washington Redskins one day and the next day you're not, right? Um, so for me, you know, as, as he was being born, I kind of had a little bit of a resentment uh, towards the athletic side of my life. Um, I'm a guy that, that loves to read. I love to write. You know, I've, I've, I just wrote a book, uh, 2017, I'm working on a couple more now. Uh, so there are so many other passions that I had that I didn't feel I ever had time to develop or dive into uh, based on how much time and commitment I put towards my sport. Um, I also had like kind of this, this um, you know, and, and it probably misdirected, but this feeling of, you know, resentment towards my father um, for always being put into different sports, right? And, yep. you know, you know, he pushed me quite a bit, um, which I look at now, you know, at 34, about to turn 35, it was the best thing that ever happened to me because, you know, him demanding excellence of me and not accepting, you know, mediocre and not accepting average from me, you know, led me to where I'm at in my career where it's nothing for me to, you know, literally... Um, Literally, I, I was in Indianapolis last week watching a player um, on Thursday um, and Friday night was in um, Friday night was in Dayton for a tournament all weekend long, Friday through Monday. First person in the gym, last person out the gym uh, and then jumped on the road back to Michigan, uh, you know, late, late Monday night. So those are things that I equate back to the work ethic that had to be. You know, my, my father instilled in me at an early age through athletics of, you know, no, you can't just be average. You can't just be good. You've got to be, the, you know, you, you have to not only be the best because it wasn't necessarily about being the best, but it was about the desire to be the best and the will to be the best and the dedication and determination to be the best. And those things at the, at the moment, I'm like, you know, resentful and I'm like, okay, nothing's ever enough. Uh, but looking back on it, it was, you know, it, it was the greatest blessing that I had in my life. So for me, when my son was born and, and I've kind of gone in stages, right? So when he was first born, it was me being resentful, not really understanding the lessons that, that athletics taught me at a young age. I purposely didn't put him in anything. You know, I said, my son will play sports when he comes to me and says he wants to play. And, you know, based off of, you know, my brother, you know, he ran track at the division one level. Uh, my dad played basketball overseas. My, you know, so I, there's the athletics just run in our family to the point where I said, "Hey, he's going to get our genes, right?" Um, <laughs> I'm, right. I'm a trainer. I get it. I understand it. When he's ready, I'll be able to help him be ready. Um, so for me, it was when he comes to me and says he's ready to play. That's when you know we'll sit down and have that conversation. Are you really ready? Because I don't do anything at half speed. And if you are ready, let's get it done. Um, so. That was the first stage. And then the second stage was when he started playing and, you know, me, me looking at it and seeing, you know, my son's harder on himself than, than I ever could be on him. And, you know, he has something that I never had. I, I, I was never surrounded by pros. And, you know, he literally, you know, depending on what day he walked in the gym, you know, when he was six, seven years old, like I said, Derek Walton's in there working, right? So this is, you know, Derek when he was in high school. So now when he's with the Clippers and my son calls me and says, Hey, Dad, remember when Derek was doing X, Y, Z? You know, now I'm seeing him on the court with the Clippers. I say, yeah, that's the difference, right? Like, he was so committed when he was in high school, and he was willing to put in work when others weren't, and that's why he is where he is, right? Or, you know, my son will say, hey, I, I remember, you know, going to that game and seeing LaMelo Ball and, and Rocket Watts and Myron Gardner and Isaiah Jackson and seeing all these guys and seeing their growth and their development. So for him, he's had so many examples of it where I don't have to be that voice. He sees those guys work ethic or he'll have a conversation with one of those guys. And that in and of itself will make him say, I mean, literally my son, I uh, posted on Instagram last week um, that we were in the gym. We, we had a, it was a midnight workout. You know, my guys had a bad shooting night the game before. And um, I, I said to him, I said, Hey, you know, gym's open. If you guys want to go, we're going. If you don't, that's on you. I, my, my days are over. And three of the guys said, coach, let's go. I want to make 500 shots. And, and, you know, we're in the gym and my son sees my Instagram the next morning. He calls me and says, hey, that's what I want. So it's not necessarily me anymore saying, hey, you know, you got to do it. It's, it's him wanting it for himself, which makes me say, okay, you know, I, I'm going to be there for him. And then as a, as a father, I've never coached him, never will. Um, I train him, you know, I, I work with him on things, but I've never coached him. When I go to his games, I never critique, you know, I never evaluate, you know, I'm an evaluator by nature, 
I never evaluate. Um, he constantly asks me, hey, dad, how did I do? And, and there's two things that I talk about. I talk about effort. And I talk about body language. If those two things are great, hey, son, you had an amazing game. You know, you did a great job. You know, your, your effort was there. You played hard. To I, I don't care if you didn't make one shot. You know, you moved your feet on defense. Uh, you communicated to your, your, your teammates. Your, you kept your head up no matter make or miss. You know, those are the things that I look at because I'm looking more so at the, the young man than, than the young athlete. Absolutely. I think there's so much, Justin, that you just said there that if we could impart that knowledge to parents out there, we could create such a better environment in the amateur sports market for kids. When we think about you know, a couple of things that you said there that, that stuck out to me, one is that the choice of what your son plays, does in his life is child-centered, not adult-centered. And I think too often in today's society, we have things that kids are making decisions that aren't their own, that dad or mom or uncle or whoever is pushing them into this activity or that activity, as opposed to it being the desire of the child. And that's one of the things that I think is really, really important for parents out there to understand is that whatever it is that your kid is going to do, if the only reason they're doing it is because you want them to do it or you're forcing them to do it, eventually they're going to be resentful of you just as a human being and they're never going to be good enough or as good as you want them to be when it's driven by the parent as opposed to driven by the adult. So I think that's the first thing that comes across that you said. And then the second piece of that that goes along with it is because you had the opportunity to, to be around people who were successful and your son has been able to then sort of see that by example and just being around an example of people who put in a lot of time, put in the effort, put in and have the work ethic that's required to be able to have success at a high level, then when he starts to say, hey, I'd like to have some of that success, now there's a blueprint that he's already seen that he can follow and then you're there in place to be able to help him. And I think that's just, it's a very healthy way to go about having a relationship as a sports parent with your child. And then the other thing I love that you said is you're not critiquing, you're not coaching. What you're doing is you're supporting those things that he can control. So he can control his body language, he can control his effort. And if you focus on those things that you can control, it's that old control the controllables statement that you hear out there. When you get to that point, then I think you've really got something. And again, you're not only building your son into a better athlete overall, but you're also continuing to maintain the type of relationship that when he's 25, he's not going to be resentful and say, oh, dad made me do all this stuff. And man, that guy was an ogre. I really, you know, I can't stand him anymore. And and that relationship ultimately is what's most important. And yeah, we all want our kids to be successful at whatever they choose to be, whether it's athletics or not. But I think ultimately you want to have a relationship with your child when they become an adult and you want to turn them into productive members of society. And that's really what it's all about. All right. So that all being said, the next question I have for you based off of your short synopsis of your career is when you start out and you say, okay, I'm done with my, my playing career is over. I, I'm no longer at the Washington Redskins training camp. What the heck am I going to do with myself? And now you say, all right, I'm going to get into the training business. How do you go about building a client base as somebody who's just starting out in the training business? Because I know there are people, I know there are people that are out there that say, oh, I'm a trainer or I would like to be a trainer, but my client base is either A, small, or B, I'm working with you know, kids that maybe aren't as talented as some of the guys that you were working with. So just talk about how you went about getting that business started. Yep, yep. So for me, um, for me, I was in a position where people just happened to see how hard I worked and they gave me opportunity based off of that. Um, I, I hate the phrase luck. You know, I hate when people tell me, oh, you're lucky. Um, and, and the reason why I hate that is because of how hard I've worked and, and what I've put into this over, you know, the last 14, 15 years. Um, so I'll start with, it wasn't just so cut and dry of, okay, I, I got cut from the Redskins, it's over. No, it was like a, after that, it was like a, a four, four or five year heartbreak that I consistently put myself through of, um, you know, and, and I would play literally anywhere. You know, I went to training camp. Um, you know, I went to training camp with several teams in the, in the AFL. I played 
you know, down in New Orleans for the New Orleans Voodoo. I played in Sacramento, uh, you know, with the San Jose Sabercats. Uh, and that was right before the Arena League folded in 2006. I want to say it's when the league folded. And it came back uh, maybe a year or so later. And I found myself, uh, I want to say 2011 or 12, that might have been my last year, and, and I was playing for uh, the Port Huron Patriots, and they were out of the Continental Indoor Football League, and I was literally making, you know, four hundred dollars a game, right? <laughs> right and yep. you know, I at, at one point, you know, and, and you know, I'm I'm playing three or four positions, you know, we're playing literally on a, on an ice rink in Port Huron that they put turf over the top of. And, you know, I hit somebody into the board, so I just got up. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, like, <laughs> what are you really doing? Like, you literally, like, your medical bill, if you were to go to the hospital tonight, would far surpass the paycheck that you're getting paid to play. And, you know, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, okay. And, and I had been training on the side. Um, I've been training on the side, and, and things were working out, right? So I was able to make ends meet. Um, but... It just really hit me that, you know, what is it that you're doing, right? And for me, and I wrote about this, and I, I didn't really expound on it as much as I want to, but uh, that's when the dream started to become a liability, where it's costing you more to chase the dream than it could ever pay you back. And that's kind of where I was at that phase. And, you know, I realized that I was having so much more fun and so much more, I had so much more passion you know, towards my training sessions than I had towards showing up to practice or going to my games um, and working with young athletes. So I, I eventually made that switch and said, I'm going to go full time in that direction. So I'll talk about kind of how my career jumped off on the training side. Uh, I did a lot for free uh, and, and I still I still do a lot for free. Uh, you know, at the phase where I'm at in my career, there's there's not a whole lot of people that I do a lot for free for. But, um, you know, when I, when my career first started, I was training out of a gym that my my trainer when I was in high school, um, he was starting a gym and he said, Justin, you know, I know when you were, you know, when you were still training for the, you know, you got cut from the Redskins, you were still training, you were living in Maryland for a while, uh, you were managing a, a fitness center. So I know you have that knowledge and experience. Can you help me out? And I said, no doubt. You know, that's, that's, that's a given. And I looked at him and said, if I can help you out, does that mean I can work out for free? <laughs> and, <laughs> and he said, yeah, because at that point in time, I still was holding on to that dream. Um, so I was in his gym and, you know, guys would come in and, you know, he, we, we did a lot of team training. And, you know, I would train teams. I, I literally, I taught Zumba for six months because the Zumba instructor, the, the, the instructor quit. And I'm like, and he looked at me and I looked at him. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> I can do this. Like, why, why can't I do this? Right. And it's literally like, I've got friends that took those classes that joke with me to this day. And like, you got, you got video of that. I, you know what? If it, if I do, <laughs> if I do, it's, it's hidden away somewhere. Understood. Um, but no, so I, so literally I did whatever it took. And that's how I met Jermaine Jackson. So Jermaine was our coach last year at Spire. Uh, I met Jermaine in, you know, maybe 2008, um, and he was bringing in his son, who now plays for LIU Brooklyn, um, and, and his son was maybe sixth grade, seventh grade, and he just saw, I guess he saw the passion that I trained with, and he said to me, he said, hey, um, will you train my team? And I said, okay, well, you know, we talked about it a little bit, and his team was small, a small AAU team, uh, the Super Friends. Uh, out of Detroit, and I said, of course, you know, let's do it, and, you know, we, we started off where it was like $10 per per session that each of the kids would, would pay, and some days you'd have 12 kids show up, and some days you'd have three kids show up, right, and Jermaine noticed that my energy level and my, my attention and my, you know, passion didn't change if we had three or we had 12, and as he saw that, more opportunities popped up, and they started to pop up, and it was a lot because, you know, he was giving me that cosign in the basketball space that, hey, you know, Justin knows what he's doing, and not only does he know what he's doing, he's getting results. So then, you know, I started getting more and more team clients. You know, teams would call me, you know, I saw what you did with Jermaine's son, or I saw what you did with Jermaine's team, you know, can you come over and work with my team? Um, and as that started to take place, well, you know, the, the price started to go up a little bit, right? And I said, okay, well, I see where this is, where this can work. But in order for it to work, I need to make sure. So that, that's when I got more business savvy with it. And I started to create guarantees and say, okay, well, look, 
this is what it cost. Uh, so let's just say, you know, let, just pulling a number out of the sky. Okay, it's a hundred dollars for that session. Whether you have five guys, or you have twenty guys, doesn't matter. So if you want to tell your guys it's ten dollars each, that's fine by me. However you want to do it, but it's a hundred dollars for that session, right? And then you know, just really, I grew my business in that way. But it was more so results focused versus, you know, I, I didn't go into it. I never looked at training as, as a money making opportunity for me. I looked at it as, you know, a way to allow me to get free gym time while I still chase my dream. And then it turned into a business. <laughs> right. Um, it, it turned into a business on its own. Um, and, you know, I think that that's kind of where I fell out of love with it, to be honest with you, was when it became a business, you know, because it, I don't like charging kids. And to this day, you know, I've worked with um, Eric Williams. He's he's um, he he just transferred from Duquesne to uh, he's at Oregon University, of Oregon now. You know, Eric was with me over the summer, and we worked out and we trained. And, you know, I, I literally I was at Spire. I drove from Spire down to Cleveland to pick him up, and brought him back to the gym for us to train. You know, used my gas. I, I think I bought him lunch. You know, and and it wasn't. I didn't ask him for a dime, but it was because somebody reached out to me and said, "Hey, Justin, I think Eric needs to get with you. He's a great kid." You know, he, he's, he's off for a couple of days or he's off for a couple of weeks prior to going to Oregon, you know, give him a call. And that's just where, like, I, I love doing that side of it. Um, and it just reignites that passion and fuels me versus the business side. And that session's over and you got to tap that kid on the shoulder and say, hey, uh, yeah, about that $35. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. It, yeah. It's yeah. just not, you know, for me, it's not, it, it's not where, where my career is at or what, what I wanted to do. So, that's where I kind of fell out of love of it. And funny, um, funny as it may be, every time I've made a shift in my career, it's been because, it, in my opinion, the money got more important than, than, than the student athletes. So the money got more important than the kids that were involved um, and caused me to look at it and reevaluate my, my morals, reevaluate evaluate my feelings and my passion for what it was. And that's why you know, I went to NCSA. Head Start Basketball, along with members of the Jay Billis Skills Camp staff, will be hosting the very first Prime Skills Camp, an affiliate of the Jay Billis Skills Camp that is held annually in Charlotte, North Carolina. Prime Skills Camp will take place on the campus of Western Reserve Academy, just outside of Cleveland, Ohio, June 26th through the 28th, and will be designed for boys rising to grades 6 through 9. Prime Skills Camp will mirror the Jay Billis Skills Camp in daily programming, teaching, coach to camper ratio, and quality of instruction. Prime Skills Camp brings all of the team-oriented individual instruction, focus on the fundamentals, and high-level coaching to young men aspiring to a high school varsity basketball experience. This camp is operated by Billis Camp veterans and includes the J. Billis Coaches Development Program alongside the camp, ensuring that the quality of teaching and coaching at this camp is second to none. Please visit headstartbasketball.com or jbilliscamp.com for more information or to get registered. Chris Krauss founded NCSA, and, and I mean, it's, if you've heard of it, you know, he's got an amazing story. If you haven't, you know, it's great to read his story, but he founded NCSA. He was playing football at, I believe he played at Vanderbilt, um, and there were a whole bunch of kids from the south side of Chicago that he grew up with that didn't have the resources to get help in the recruiting process and didn't go to college, and he felt like they were way more talented than he was. Um, and these kids missed out. So when his career was done, you know, he created the scouting service and his mission was to identify and find those kids that didn't quite have the resources or have the help to, to get discovered and get to that next level. And that's why NCSA was founded. And, you know, amazing. He built this company, the 700 employee company on, on that mission and that goal. Um, and, you know, a couple of years back, my last year at NCSA, uh, we were acquired. And we were acquired by the company that owns Be Recruited, um, you know, and, and it, it just, it, it started turning into from, from the mission of changing lives, it turned into the mission of month-to-month -month sales goals. And I said, wait a minute, like, that's not, you know, I came here because I read Chris's story and I was like, hey, that's somebody I want to work with and work for. Uh, that's somebody that, you know, I'm passionate about helping these young student athletes. So I'm on board for that. And when it came, when it, when it became more of a financial situation, and you're sitting there talking to a family that you know that kid's D3 at best. Um, and, and you're you're feeling a difference between what you know and, and what you feel like you're supposed to say on that call or what you're supposed to say in, in that in that setting. Um, for me, it wasn't something I could do. And my, my you know, my 
my self, my soul wouldn't allow me to do it. So I walked away. Um, and when I walked away, I wrote a book on the recruiting process. I started doing seminars all around the country to talk to student athletes about recruiting. And you know, my mission was, my goal was, hey, I'm not going to charge. You know, I'm never going to charge somebody to help them in the recruiting process. Uh, fast forward to taking the role at Spire. You know, when they called me about, you know, coming to Spire and turn around the basketball program there, um, I got on campus and saw a, an amazing facility. I I love the story of the reason why it was built. Um, and, you know, we sought out to create something special and help student athletes that were there. And once again, when it became more about finances and more about how much can we get these kids to pay um, for, for you know, prep school. And I'm sitting there like, well, wait a minute. Um, and don't, don't get me on that hole because I'll go, I'll go off about, you know, preps versus uh, normal high schools. But it's like, wait a minute, why is this family, why should a family pay $50,000 to go to prep school when they can go to their, their local high school and get that, like for me, it was, I was passionate about the project that we created at Spire because it was an opportunity to, uh, to change the status quo, you know, for me. You know, if we're being honest about it, last year at Spire, you'll see the majority of our team was Michigan kids. And part of that was to wake everybody up and say, hey, you know, Michigan, the rules that the, the MHSA has restricting travel, restricting, you know, uh, TV games, restricting... I mean, it's hurting and holding back kids. We had an opportunity uh, to take some of the best players from the state of Michigan and put them on this prep school team in Ohio and really shock the world and open up the eyes of everybody around the country and say, hey, there's another way for this to be done. And uh, we were able to walk away from that. And when I walked away, you know, last year, Aspire was probably the most recognizable game in high school, a recognizable brand in high school basketball. So it, it was those things that were exciting and fun for me. And when the money got involved and it was, okay, you know, we got to get more payers and how much can we get this family to pay? And, you know, I'm like, look, that's not, that, that's never going to be me, right? That's never going to be, I, I'm never going to be the one to look a family in the face and say, you know, this is something that is going to, you know, be worth their while. When in reality, there's a lot of amazing public high schools that you can get the same result for free. Right. Like, yeah, ch exactly. Chances are, if you're about to pay me 40,000 a year at Spire, chances are your, your, your child probably isn't a division one athlete to begin with. So that means you're paying something for college. So you are better invested taking that money, setting it in some kind of savings uh, fund, getting him a trainer, developing him, getting him an ACT tutor, getting the highest score possible on his test. And now, hey, we're going to minimize our, our out of pocket expense for college. But guess what? That out of pocket expense is going to match, you know, what we were going to spend for your high school experience anyway. So what's, wh why are we doing this? So that's kind of where, where I was kind of, you know, in, in a, in a, in a, um, a moral bind there. So I, what I hear you saying basically through this whole thing is it comes back to telling kids the truth, telling families the truth and helping them to have a realistic expectation of where they could continue their career beyond high school. And I think that's something that is a challenge out there because especially when you get into, I think if you talk to parents of fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth graders, and I know there's surveys out there that I can't quote them off the top of my head of the percentage of parents who think their kids are going to play a division one sport when their kids are in sixth grade. And it's, it's some ridiculous percentage, like 45% or 55%. I forget exactly what it is, but there's such a disconnect for parents and families in terms of what they actually can do and what in many cases they're being told can happen for them. And so when I hear you talking about the fact that you're in places where it becomes difficult to tell those people the truth because of the business side of it, I can totally see where that happens. And, you know, you can either tell people the truth or you can tell them what they want to hear and keep your business running. And right. I think what I hear you saying is, you want to be the person that's going to tell them the truth because you have the best interest of that student athlete and their family in mind. And a lot of times, again, people are very unrealistic either because of whatever their own perceptions or too often it's because somebody somewhere has told them something that's completely unrealistic for their kid. And I see that way too much, unfortunately, Justin. Yeah. Well, what, what for me, for me, it was never difficult to tell the truth. Right. Um, and, what what it did was it caused issues on the back end um, because you know me telling the truth sometimes would uh, would, would frustrate or upset you know the the people that you know I, I worked with or worked for and you know I've always looked at it from a standpoint of 
I'm and I'm I'm the type of person that can always find a way. You know, money's never been a motivating factor for me, and it seems like when I focus less on the money, I make more of it. <laughs> um, so. Yeah. So for me, it was like, I'm always going to be true to myself. And I, I had this conversation literally with a player just yesterday. Um, at, at, uh, the, the, uh, so I consult at Core Prep now, and that's one of my roles is just you know placement and talking to these kids about what that looks like. And one of my biggest things, and it's hard coming in mid-year, okay? So expectation management is number one for me. And, and I sit down with families. You know, when I was at Spire, you know, we would have that conversation from the very beginning. Hey, what is what are you, what are your expectations? What are you looking to get out of this? Because the reality is, if you're, you know, there, there's some guys that have real un, uh, unimaginable growth spurts out of nowhere, or they develop crazy, you know, um, from from junior or senior year. Those things happen, so you can't look at a kid and say, okay, you won't be that, or you or you can't be that. Um, but the way basketball is trending. There's, you know, there's seventh graders that have scholarship offers already. You know, Jerry Easter out of Toledo, um, he's a kid that, you know, I've been talking to, to him and his dad about, you know, what that looks like and him playing for us, um, you know, with our program. You know, he, he's got scholarship offers as a seventh grader. Now, granted, yes, that is, you know, a little bit out of the norm. But what I'm saying is, you know, you can almost start to identify with what these Division One players look like and who they are um, from – from an early age. Uh, and then, you know, the other side of it is, and what frustrates me is you have a lot of parents that talk about their kids being Division One athletes or being pros. I hear that term way too much. Oh, he's a pro. He's a future pro. If I hear that one more time, I, I might vomit. But, you know, what happens with that is I sit back and I say, hey, you know, I literally, I'll go to 20 to 30 college basketball games a year. Um, I, I go to practices. I, I have, you know, I have Boston College's practice right now on my computer from the day that I was there. The coaches were really nice. They sent it over to me because there were a couple of drills and things that I liked in it. Um, I'll sit in meetings with kids that talk about their Division One, and I'll pop in that practice and say, look at that and tell me who you can guard. And then I'll circle a player that I know is a walk-on, and I'll ask him, hey, can you guard him? Oh, no, Coach, he's, he's pretty good. So, yeah, he's a walk-on. He's paying sixty thousand dollars a year to go to Boston College, and you're sitting here telling me that you're a Division One scholarship kid. Come on, like let's be realistic. And I think that part of the problem is, oh, the the main problem, the biggest problem is there's a lot of good money in bad basketball. So, or, or there's a lot of good money in bad athletics in general. So you've got a lot of people that sell a dream because it's easier to sell a dream than it is to sell drugs. You can make a whole lot more money off of it and you don't have the risk of going to jail. So you have these guys that, you know, will sell a dream all day long and tell a kid, hey, you can be this, you can be that, because they know that once the kid's hooked, the parents are hooked because they have no choice but to be hooked. Because if they don't invest, now their kid's looking at them saying, hey, you're not believing in my dream or you're not supporting my dream. Um, you know, you're, you're holding me back. And, and parents are afraid of their kids being resentful that is if they're if they the parents are realistic and have realistic um, you know kind of observations of what their child is. But if they're unrealistic as well, now you got them in hook, line, and sinker, and they're with this trainer that has no clue what he's doing, who's never seen a Division One player himself, that's telling this kid that because he's big he can be a Division One kid. They're investing thousands and thousands of dollars a year, um, and then you know senior year rolls around and they have nothing. You know, and what that does and what that where that hurts guys like me in the process that work in, in prep basketball or postgraduate basketball is you have all these kids with unrealistic expectations that have been pre-programmed of what they can be or should be. And they've been told by so many people what they're capable of being and people that had a vested interest um, in them. So now when you come along and you give them the truth and the truth comes singularly, you know, lies come in, in groups, right? Or, or people telling you what you want to hear. They're going to be there. That, that comes through the masses because people want you to be happy. They want you to be their friend. They want you to be around them. They want you to sign up for their team or sign up for their training. So now when you come in and you inject a little bit of truth and you're the only person that's saying that now you're the jerk, right? <laughs> like, yep. like, who is this guy that's telling me that I'm not going to go to the NBA when I'm five foot four, but I've got a great jump shot. Like, right. Right. I, I'm sorry, so buddy. True. Like it, yep. chances are, but here's the thing. Who cares? You know, I tell my son all the time. I said, nobody, I've never once been hired for a position or called for a position because they looked on my resume and saw, oh, you played division one football. No, they looked at my resume and they said, you were a winner everywhere you've been. 
And since you've been there, you've created this, you've done this. It's my work ethic that gets me that call. It's, it's the results that I've gotten that gets me that call. It doesn't matter if you're Division I or NAIA. And I think that, you know, we're pre-programming these kids that is D1 or bus. And the reality is there's a whole lot of great basketball being played at all levels. I sit there and watch. I watched the Division Three National Championship last year. I'm like, holy, you know, half these kids could play Division One basketball. These kids are good. Absolutely. You know, you know, Absolutely. Wisconsin, I think that's Oshkosh. Yeah. Like, yep. like yeah. they'll, they'll tear it up. You know what I Absolutely. mean? Absolutely. We've had we've had Casey Casey Corn, who's an assistant at Oshkosh. He's been on twice with us. He came on right after the National Championship game last year. And, Again, he said the same thing, and we've talked to a bunch of Division Three coaches, Justin, on the podcast, and one of the things that they say to a man is a lot of times they'll go in and they'll sit down with the player and their families, and, you know, those kids, especially if you're talking about one of the better Division Three programs in the country, a lot of those kids are kids who maybe have aspirations of playing at the Division One level, and they'll talk to these kids and They'll say to them, "Well, have you ever watched a Division three basketball game? Have you ever been to a Division three basketball game?" And they're like, eighty percent of the time, the answer is no. The kids never even seen a Division three basketball game. And I, and I say it all the time on the podcast, and I say it to people out there who say their kids are going to get a scholarship to play basketball. And I'm like, "Have you ever watched Division three basketball? Do you know how good you have to be just to get on a Division three team, let alone play, let alone?" get a division one scholarship people have no idea how good you have to be and then conversely goes to what you just talked about a second ago is from a work ethic standpoint the amount of time and effort and desire and just again work that you have to put in in order to make that happen unless you are just unbelievably gifted the amount of time and effort that it's going to be required for you to play college basketball at any level is something that the average parent of a kid, again, who I'm thinking of, you know, older elementary school kids, middle school kids, early in high school, who haven't had maybe as much experience with it, those parents and those kids have no idea what it takes. Yeah, not at all. And and if they did, a lot of them would say, you know what, I'm good. Right. It's not worth it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that that's just, I mean, you know, so for me, I, I try and I, I try and manage those expectations on the front end. Um, and, and I've done... You know, I'll never forget, um, I'll never forget I, I did a, a seminar. So when I first started doing seminars, recruiting seminars, um, I, I had a, um, I brought my whole family and I, I was excited and I wanted them to critique me. I really didn't want them to critique me, right? Because, you know, I'm like, you know, I'm like, I know they're going to point out everything that I did. They're, they're fine. They're finding everything. Right, they're right. They're like, they're like, oh yeah, this, this is the guy that tells me I didn't make my bed good enough. All right, I got you. Right. So, um, so we finished that first seminar and, we, and I walked away and I'm in the car and I'm having the conversation. And, and one thing was, was, it was a resounding message that came back to me and it said, you know, the second you brought up the statistics about how many of these kids are not going to make it to the next level, you lost the room. And it was true because they had never heard that. Right. They've been told by so many people, oh yeah, you can do it. You got it. You know, you're, you know, Everybody's telling them how great they are. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think we need people to breathe life into us. But I think we need people to breathe, breathe realistic life into us, right? Okay, hey, get your GPA up to this point. Get your test score up to this point. And you're going to be a candidate for Division Three. And, you know, if you work on this part of your game, okay, that'll elevate you to Division Two. Um, if you have that crazy growth spurt and you're six six and can do all those things that we talked about before, now you got an outside shot at, at Division One, right? So it's just kind of like being direct and being honest with our kids. And setting expectations where, you know, I, I think that we focus way too much on the result and not enough on the journey and the destination, right? And that's kind of, you know, the conversation that I've had with my son is, hey, enjoy the, enjoy the now. Enjoy the journey. Like, this is what I want you to care about. I want you to care about the daily, you know, like, you know, be going in and putting in your work every day and getting better and understanding and being able to identify that, I put in X amount of hours and it yielded Y amount of results because those are the, the, the lessons that are going to carry over for the rest of their life, not whether or not they play Division One, not whether or not they're successful, right? And I think we gauge how effective something is too often based off of the, the success or lack of success on the back end versus the growth and development. And that's where youth basketball is struggling right now is we're training and coaching kids for the result, not for development. And that's killing the game. I agree with you 100%. I don't think you could have said it any better because one of the things that 
I always look at. I look at it through the lens of myself as a player way back when, and then I look at it with my son who's currently in eighth grade. And I, I think when you talk about enjoying the journey as opposed to the result, like I was a kid when I was playing, I wanted to be a Division One basketball player. I wanted to be a professional basketball player from the time I could walk. That was what my obsession was. I loved basketball. That was what I wanted to do. And I didn't have some of the physical gifts that guys that I ended up playing against had and didn't allow me to get to the the NBA level, to the professional level. But I was able to get to the Division One level. And now I look back on it as a guy who's nearly 50 years old. And I think ultimately what was the result of my basketball career? What did I what did I get out of it? What was important to me? And when I think about that, I think about the memories that I created, not just as a high school player and a college player. I think about the players and the, the friends that I made through the game. And then I think about the lessons that I learned about hard work and perseverance and being able to fight through adversity and all those kinds of things. And to me, as you said, the problem with youth basketball today, the problem with high school basketball today is so many people are using that as a means to an end where they are only focusing on what's at the end of that rainbow instead of focusing on the rainbow itself. And so I think you have to, and this is what I've tried to do with my son. And it sounds like a similar philosophy to what you're doing with your son is I try to enjoy every minute that he plays and same thing with my daughters. And I think you just have to, as a parent, you just want to make sure that your kids are enjoying that journey, that they're not focused on, what the next thing is. I could care less if my son plays high school basketball, let alone plays college basketball. If that's what he wants to do and he wants to keep playing, great. I'm going to be happy to sit in the stands and have a smile on my face and, and watch him. But it's that journey that's important to me. It's not where he's going to end up. And who knows where he'll end up. He may end up being done playing next year, or maybe he'll end up getting a bug of the game and, and end up going and playing college basketball. I have no idea. But I think your point is exactly on point that it's it's about the journey. It's not about the end. It's not, it's not where you finish. It's just about enjoying every single minute. And too often we look at high school basketball today, we look at youth basketball today as a way to get a scholarship. And I'm just not sure. You made a great point about if they saw what it took, they might not really want it. And I think that is that is so true. And it's something that I wish and I hope that parents out there hear that message and kids out there hear that message that it's it takes a lot to get there and make sure you enjoy the journey along the way because if you fall short you don't want to look back at it and be like man i wasted all this time focused on something that i wasn't able to achieve absolutely absolutely and i think that that's for me that's what's made this this journey i mean at this point in my life and it took like i said almost 10 years to really realize it but being able to look at it and say okay it wasn't about the destination. It was about the journey all along and the things that it taught me. And when I started to focus on that, you know, I wasn't resentful uh, for my career being over. I wasn't, you know, resentful for the hours that I put in, right? And the, the summers that I missed with my friends and, you know, the, the dates that I never went on, right? Or, you know, the, uh, the, the days that I want to just relax because my friends, I saw them hanging out and they were like, hey, we're going to go you know, ride bikes. And I'm like, okay, I wish I could, but I've got a travel soccer game today. Or, you know, every weekend being somewhere else in some other state, whether it be for hockey related or, or soccer related or whatever. Um, initially, you have resentment. Uh, but, you know, when I when I began to, to change the, the way that I thought and change the way that I, I viewed that, and when my perspective changed, my value of that time changed. And I be, began to identify with Hey, what what that provided for me was countless. You know, it was it was. You know, there's no price tag that could be put on it. And you know, when I look back on it, yeah, there were some things that were missed out on, but there are things that made you know there there are things that made and shaped me. But I have those conversations with guys all the time. Like, do you want to go to college and join a frat and have fun with your friends, or do you want to go to college and it's a job because that's really what it is. You know, do you understand what that looks like? You know, the six a.m. workouts, the you know, you're you're in class from eight to twelve, then you're on the court from or you're in film session from 12 to maybe 132. Then you've got practice from 2 to 4. Then from there you've got you know more film study, maybe some individual development, team dinner, 
Uh, if you're a freshman, now you got study hall. You're talking 12 hour days every single day. Is this really what you want? And I think that a lot of them just don't realize that that's what it looks like. And, and that's why, you know, the transfer portal looks the way it looks, you know, and I talk about yeah, it all exactly. the time. You know, I, I yep. talk about, you know, the growth of the transfer portal as of yesterday, because I look at it every Tuesday and I tweet about it every Tuesday. Yeah, and I don't think I tweeted yesterday. My son was sick. Uh, my, my youngest was sick. And, you know, uh, we've been we've been at the hospital, but you know, 121 names in, in the transfer portal. Um, and we're not even through the end of January. Right. And I look at the, the number of those kids, how many of them are freshmen? And it's ridiculous. And, and a lot of it is because you've got a coaches that are overselling their kid and telling coaches that they're way better than what they really are, not telling the truth. Right. Um, and that's why I tell guys all the time, like, you really don't want to train with me if you're, you know, if, you, if you're a knucklehead, because if you're a person that doesn't have that high character, or doesn't have that work ethic or you know, is, is doing stupid stuff off the court, guess what? I have to tell these college coaches that. And right. most guys say, well, I have to tell these college coaches that because I want to be able to put kids in school there years to come. And I'm a trainer or an evaluator or, you know, my position now in AAU, you know, recruiting coordinator. No, that's not the reason why I tell those coaches that. I tell them that because I look at these coaches very differently than everybody else does. You know, these guys are my friends. You know, Anthony Solomon, um, the associate head coach at Dayton, him and I speak every single day. And most of our conversations are less about basketball, more about our wives and kids and more about you know, how we're, we're, we're dealing with the work-life balance or more about like what, is our, what did our son do that day in school or you know, things like that. So this is a friend of mine and I see you know, his coaching job is how he feeds and takes care of his family. You know, that's, and for me to send him a kid that could potentially cause him to lose his job that's much bigger than me not being able to send him another kid to play for him in th two, three years. You know, that's, that's devastating. So I'm never going to do that to one of my friends. So when I build relationships with these college coaches, they're genuine relationships. And I'm never going to put a kid in a position to, you know, jeopardize how that man takes care of his family. So I tell guys all the time, if you don't really want this and you're not dedicated and committed to it, you might as well just stay away from me because I'm not going to help you get somewhere that you don't deserve to be. This, this game... To, to me, um, you know, Billy Wu, assistant coach at Boston College, told me a, a couple of months back, he said, hey, you know, success never rewards the wrong person. And, and I truly believe that. Uh, so I'm not going to be that one to hype a kid just because he was working with me or paying for services or whatever and call coaches and say, hey, he's a great kid if he's really not. Or, you know, hey, you know, he's a hard worker, but he's missed every optional workout I've given him over the last two years. <laughs> no, that's not right. going to happen. Right. Of course he showed right. up when he had to. Everybody shows up when they have to, right? Like that's, right. that's the normal. So that's like, I, you know, and I think that not enough people are being real for multiple reasons. You know, you've got high school coaches that, you know, are, are looking at, okay, hey, the more kids I put in college, you know, the better my program looks. I literally have dealt with coaches that, you know, have pushed guys to go higher than what they even know they belong at. You know, for example, sending a kid to, you know, the, let's just say ACC, for example, and you know he's a MAC level talent, but he's got some ACC kind of, you know, attributes. No, you need to, hey, guess what, kid? Even though you have those ACC offers, you're not going to play there. And you don't have the work ethic to play there. You don't have, but guess what? You can go to the MAC or the Horizon League and probably be a conference player of the year at some point. So maybe we need to look at the right fit versus what looks good on Instagram, what looks good on Twitter. Uh, we need to figure out what's going to be the best fit for you. And that's what we're not seeing a lot of right now in, in high school in um, AU basketball is guys saying, hey, I'm going to place this kid in the right place for him versus in the right place for, for my future recruiting and my future you know, uh, ability to get other players to come play for me. That, that's kind of my pet peeve right now in the marketplace. Yeah, I think it's a challenge because, A, when you're a 17 or 18-year-old kid and you're looking to make that college decision and you have an opportunity to go and play, let's say, at one level above where maybe you belong, it's hard for that kid. Let, let's say they only get – let's say they get an offer from whatever, an ACC school, and the rest of their offers are from mid-majors. It's hard to tell that kid who's – been playing his whole life. Hey, you can't play there because that guy's going to say, well, man, coach, coach there thinks I can play there. Uh, and yet <clears throat> we all know that, as you said, when you described the, the transfer portal and just the number of kids that go to a situation that ends up not being the right situation for them, 
and where they're where they are playing at a level, you know, they're they're at a school where they're probably where they probably don't belong, and that becomes a huge challenge. And then we all know once you transfer schools and you start moving around, it becomes difficult to have a solid, stable college basketball career. And I just know that the amount of time that and now we're talking when I played was uh, from 19, I graduated from high school in 1988. So we're talking, it was a long time ago and things are, things are different. I didn't spend any time in the summer on campus. Like our season ended and coach handed me a workout on a piece of paper and said, all right, we'll see you back in, you know, we'll, we'll see you back next August. Uh, and, you know, you kind of fended for yourself. And obviously that's a lot different at the division one level today where guys are basically on campus 11 months of the year and, you know, doing all those things. But nonetheless, I think that it's that's one of the challenges is for kids who do get those high offers or get an offer maybe one offer above where the majority of uh, of people feel they could be. It's difficult to tell that 17 or 18 year old kid, hey, don't take that you know don't take that chance. And yet we know that a lot of kids do, and it ends up not working out the way that they hope. Well, it's only difficult if you've lied to that kid. Yeah, that's true. Right? That's true. So yep, that's if true. you've built that relationship on honesty, you've built that relationship on integrity, you've built that relationship on trust, and you've always been genuine and real with that kid and with that family, uh, then it's not it's not a difficult conversation to have, right? And from my perspective, I, I, I have those conversations and I don't think twice about them. You know, hey, look, th- let's, let's take a look at this. Think about it. That offer came in late from that ACC school. Why? Because they had one to burn. They didn't get the kid they wanted. So they're going to recruit you. But guess what? Next year, they're going to recruit four or five other five stars. You are a two star. You're a Mac level player. That's where, you know, if everybody else is recruiting you and, and every analyst has got you at the Mac level, yeah, you probably can go to that level. But what do you want to do? Do you want to go to that level and be recruited around? Or do you want to go to where, you know, I believe? And I think that once again, it comes back to knowledge of the game and knowledge of, of opportunities. Um, and I'm not saying this to pat myself on the back, but I don't think there's anybody else that's sitting in as many college practices as I'm sitting in. There's not anybody else that's going to as many college games as I'm going to. So when I have those conversations with families, you know, and when I have those conversations with my players, they know it's coming from an educated place. It's not coming from a guess of, you know, hey, I think you can play at this level. And that's one of the things that, you know, I literally, I dealt with that not too long ago. Um, you know, I had a player, and I, I'm not going to say any names or what school they're from, um, but you know, I had a high school coach tell them, Hey, no, you know, you need to just settle at this level that's offered you. Uh, because if you don't, you know, and the coach had a player that went higher a few years back and, you know, it never panned out. And so, yeah, you just need to settle. You just need to commit now. This is, you know, it's a great opportunity. And, you know, in the background, I'm looking at the situation saying, wait a minute, this player is, you know, a junior, they still have an entire year and a half to play. Um, you're saying that their best fit is at that level, but you don't have any relationships at levels higher. So you haven't really pushed to get them any exposure beyond the level that they're at. Um, and, and quite as kept, I don't think I've ever seen or heard of you being in a college practice, let alone a college game. So I don't think you really even know what that level looks like. You know, so in those instances, it's frustrating for me because I put so much time into it, right? And I, I know what that looks like and I know what that feels like. So when I'm having that conversation with my guys, I'm able to come from a place of love and say, hey, look, I, I genuinely, you know, every kid I've ever coached, every kid that I've ever worked with, um, I get overly invested in them. And that's one of my problems. And I'm trying to figure out how to way, a, a way to get better at that. But I get so emotionally invested in them um, and I end up wanting it for them more than they want it for themselves in, in a lot of occasions. Uh, but you know, I'm able to come to them from that place of love and say, look, I don't want to see you depressed two and a half years from now because you're not touching the floor. You know, I don't want to see you get somewhere and it just not be the right situation, the right fit. And you went there based off of the, the name on the front of the jersey. And now you're calling me and we got to find somewhere else for you to go. And now your leverage is gone because that those same Mac schools that wanted you before, they're going to look at you and say, oh, well, you know, hey, you got to walk on now. Or, you know, based off of transfer rules, you might have to sit a year. Like, I don't want to see that happen. So, you know, I, I'm very direct with my guys. And I say from, from day one, your college decision is not a four-year decision. It's a 40-year decision. What you do in those, next, in those four years of college are going to set you up for success or regret for the next 40 years of your life afterwards. 
So it's something that you can't take lightly. You know, if you're being recruited and you're not going and watching practices, if you're not getting out and watching games, if you're not, I mean, ESPN Plus is four ninety nine a month. You can watch every game, you know, every Division <laughs> yep. One game there is in some Division Twos and. You know, uh, Flow Sports is like nineteen dollars a month, and they air all the Division Two and Division Three games. So, I mean, there's ways if you really want to know. You know, you can research this thing and see what it really likes looks like. Um, but if you're making an uninformed decision, shame on you. Um, and if these coaches are giving uninformed advice, sh- double shame on them. And unfortunately, that's what we're seeing a lot of. Because I'll tell you, at least on the boys' side. Um, there's some coaches that do a great job. You know, uh, Munch, Munch Williams, I did an interview with him a while back. He's with PSA Cardinals, um, he, which is another EYBL program and, and you, know, uh, you know, technically a rival of all Ohio Red. But, you know, Munch does everything the right way. And, and I absolutely love him because, you know, when, when I'm at Seton Hall, I look up and he's at Seton Hall. You know what I mean? And it's like, you know, obviously he has a player there right now, Quincy McKnight. But, you know, when he's telling one of his players, hey, you can play at Seton Hall. It's not a conversation of what he thinks. It's he's been around that program. He's watched Seton Hall play, right? Or when I jump in my car and I drive two hours south when, I, when I'm in um, Baltimore and I go down to watch George Mason practice and I bump into one of his assistants or him at George Mason, you know, I, I can trust when he's telling me, hey, yeah, this kid's good enough to play in, in the Atlantic 10. Why? Because I know he's at that, those Atlantic 10 practices. I know he's watching those games. He's evaluating who's there, where, what level they're playing at. Um, and, you know, for, for me, that makes it where there's, I can trust what these people are saying. And, and I give so much weight to that, but it frustrates me so much when I see those guys that aren't doing that and aren't as invested in it. And that's fine. I'm not saying every high school coach has to be uberly invested into the recruiting process and has to study it like they, like, like I do, or like a lot of these guys at the highest level do, um, but stay out of our way, right? Don't sit there and tell a kid that, you know, no, I believe this is the right fit for you, and I'm your coach. I, I know more, you know, da, 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 da. And it's like, hey, dude, I have never seen you at a, at a college practice. So why are you interrupting, you know, what I'm trying to do to help this, this student athlete, right? Or making it where the kid feels like, oh, well, I don't want to go against my coach. He controls my playing time. So it's almost one of those situations where I really wish that coaches that didn't understand the recruiting process and aren't willing to put the work into the recruiting process will raise their hand and say, hey, guess what, mom and dad, player, this is not what I do. This is not my specialty. I have no clue what I'm doing in this in this realm. I, I answer the, co- the calls when college coaches call me, but outside of that, I really don't know what to tell you. That's great. Now those parents know that they need to seek some outside resources. And I just think that that honesty is not there. That transparency is not there. People would rather pretend like they have the understanding of the process versus you know show a little bit of vulnerability and say, hey, guess what? That's just not my wheelhouse. Hoopheads Nation, check out these new offerings from Tyler Whitcomb Basketball Coaching Courses. The Bob Knight 1981 National Champion Indiana Hoosiers Playbook and the Will Wade LSU 2019-2020 Playbook are now available. Visit coachtube.com slash users slash Tyler Whitcomb to check out these great resources. So in your mind, how do we bridge that gap because there's always whenever you have conversations with whether it's high school coaches or you have uh, you know you have discussions with people on the AAU side of it there's always this uh, give and take there's always a little bit of uh, you know underlying animosity between the two sides where you know high school coaches look at it and say oh AAU it's you know there's this renegade mentality and there's all this and that and you know what I hear you talking about is the knowledge that you're bringing to the game and what you're understanding and how you're able to help kids. And so in your mind, how do we make, what, what's the bet, what's the ideal framework to put it together an ideal framework for a high school coach working with an AAU program? What does the ideal scenario look like? Because I think a lot of times what we hear is, you know, we hear the complaints Mm -hmm. and we hear people saying, Oh, if, if only this was different or if this was better, and I know for me, like I always go back to like I I lament the demise of playground basketball myself because I loved that's the way I grew up. I grew up playing on the playground. I didn't necessarily grow up in the system that we have today. So I look at it and go, man, I wish I wish there was more kids playing playing playground basketball. And then you see the positives. I hear what you're talking about, and 
you know, just the ability of somebody who's in that world like you are all the time and you have this knowledge that you can share with players. So how do we bridge that gap between the AAU system and high school coaches to the benefit of the student athlete, not to the benefit of high school coaches, not to the benefit of an AAU program, but what does it look like? What's that ideal framework between the two? Yep. So I'd say in the blue sky world, um, honesty and transparency from everybody involved. And I think that both sides get a bad rap. And I think the reason why they get a bad rap is a lot of times there's not a lot of honesty involved. And, and, you know, and that's threefold, right? So honesty from the parent, what is your, you know, you have parents that'll move a kid from one school to another and say, oh yeah, you know, as AAU coach, you know, I was talking to him and he get, no, you had that idea to transfer. <laughs> you were unhappy before, right? Like you, you walked into that AAU coach's office saying, Hey, I, you know, I'm not happy with what my high school coach is doing. And you know, you, you're using that, that AAU coach. I think AAU kind of picks up the scapegoat for that. Um, but you know, I think that, that just being realistic, I think being honest and being straightforward, you know, I, I come from, you know, I come from the world of under promising and over delivering. And I think that a lot of these high school coaches or AAU coaches or whoever, they're doing a whole lot of over promising and under delivering, which causes animosity and resentment um, and sometimes misplaced animosity and resentment. But I think that one of the things that that could help and, and would help is, is communication and transparency. You know, a high school coach saying, all right, hey, Tell me who it is that you're looking at potentially playing for on the AAU level. Um, and let's all sit down and have a conversation. You know, let me talk to him about kind of, hey, what I see from you, some of the things that, that I need um, development-wise, the help that I need from you, and vice versa. And now we're a team, right? Like everybody's working for the greater good of this student athlete. There's no, well, that this coach is mad because I, I miss summer league, uh, you know, whatever which I get it. Yeah, you wanted that team atmosphere, that team, you know, that, that you, your guys working together as a team. But guess what, high school coach A, you're going to lose that kid. He's going to transfer out of your system if his parents are looking at it from the standpoint of you're putting your high school, um, you're putting your high school summer workouts above AAU periods where these kids are playing in front of hundreds of, of college scouts. And that's what's kind of been to me kind of the the issue is that it has been a renegade system where you have AU coaches that'll, you know, move guys around here and there. And um, so high school coaches have then over the years said, hey, oh, well, I hate AAU. I'm not going to put my kids in AAU program. And it's not helping anybody. It's hurting the kids ultimately versus saying, you know what? I'm going to build relationships with these guys in my area, the top AAU guys in my area, and say, okay, well, I'm going to build these relationships and see how I can help them and how we can all be mutually beneficial to each other. So now I know who I'm dealing with, and it's not a, you know, a, a boogeyman that lives underneath the, the bed. It's a, hey, I'm hearing this, and that doesn't sound like the Justin I know. Let me pick up the phone and call Justin, right? And I think that there's just not enough. You talked about the loss of playground basketball. I'll take it one step further. It's the loss of, of proper interpersonal communication skills, right? Like everybody has these phones in front of their hands. So they're, they're <laughs> so quick to tweet, text, DM, whatever, versus picking up the phone and making a phone call and saying, hey, you know, I want to talk to you about something. X, Y, Z is going on, right? And there's one or two things that can happen. That person can say, yep, that's exactly what I said. Or nope, that's not what I said. That's not how it came across. This is what actually took place, right? But for whatever reason... We're quick to jump on social media and blast this and say this and do that. And it just grows this major divide. And neither party is going to, you know, it's no win for either side. And you've got the kids in the middle that end up lost and confused and hurt, right? You've got the kids that are like, okay, well, I don't want to go play for this AAU program because my coach, my high school coach hates that coach. But guess what? That program probably could get me the best level of exposure to get an opportunity to play college basketball. So I, I, it's just, it's, it's frustrating, but I think it all starts with honesty, transparency, and communication. If those three things happen, um, we won't be talking so much about how AAU basketball is killing high school basketball, which I, I read that article every other day, it seems like. We'll be talking more about how AAU basketball is a, um, you know, it, it, it's a, a bridge builder between high school and college basketball and how that can make it that much easier for a student athlete to find opportunities. Um, you know, how it can, you know, allow that coach. I mean, let's be real. Most high school basketball coaches, 
they have a full time job uh, because high school basketball, unless you're in, you know, in Georgia, there's some schools in Georgia, some schools in Florida, there's some schools in Texas, some schools in California that pay, you know, a living wage off of just being a basketball coach, but most don't. So you have a full time job on top of the fact that you have a family, you have children, that you don't have 50 hours a week to navigate your team through the recruiting process or to be on the phone nonstop talking to college coaches about what that process looks like or to be going to visit and watch these college practices. You just don't have that time. You don't have that time to build those relationships and know, okay, hey, this is a good fit for my student athlete. A lot of these AAU coaches, a lot of the good ones do. They have those relationships. So why are we trying to reinvent the wheel instead of working together for the greater good of the student athlete? And I think that once we kind of pull ego aside, um, that everybody can win. And, and that's one of the things that I've kind of prided myself on over the years is, you know, you, you've never heard or you never will hear me say, oh, that's my kid or I did that for that kid. No, it's we. We're a team. Anybody that's ever worked with that kid is responsible for his success in one way or another, either in spite of or because of, right? And, you know, that when we have that teamwork mentality and we all build these relationships, uh, we, we can definitely help these student athletes a whole lot more than they're being hurt. And plus, it eliminates a lot of the, it eliminates a lot of the, the false sales pitches, right? Because the communications there, if you know his high school coach and you have a relationship and you can't tell that kid anything that's not true because that kid's going to talk to his coach. It's, it's, it's too, but when nobody, when, when all parties don't speak and don't coexist together, you know, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing. And over here, you're telling the kid, oh, you can do this. And the coach is telling him realistically, hey, guess what? You're a division two player. Now this player is resentful to his high school coach. He's pulling closer to his AAU coach and now transferring schools. Why? Because there was no communication. So I just think that the, the key to it all is communication. Yeah, I agree with you there. I think that if we could get both groups on the same page and then it's just like any other profession, there are people who do it well and do it right and there are people who don't. And so as a result of that, it's sometimes when there isn't communication, then as you said, it can generate that resentment between both groups with AAU resenting high school coaches, high school coaches resenting AAU coaches, and then ultimately who's affected the kids. And I think there's a balance too. And it goes back to what you said right off the top where, you know, you talk about when you're a trainer and you got to tell the kids the truth. And I think that if you're a high school coach and you're telling kids the truth about the level that they can play at, the role they're going to play on your team and the kid's not happy with that and the kid decides to leave, well, then ultimately as a high school coach, I'm probably better off if the kid wasn't going to buy into the role that I believe he was best suited for. 100%. And I think this, and I think the same thing goes on the AAU side. And we have to make sure that no matter which side of that fence we're on, that ultimately what we're looking to do is to do the best thing that we can for our programs and for our kids. And if you do that and you have that in mind as you go through it, whether you're a high school coach or whether you're on the AAU side of things, I think that by communicating with each other, we're going to end up getting a better result. I think you did a very good job of describing how important that communication can be and how it can benefit the kids who are a part of it. And that's really, I think, a big key as we move forward with grassroots basketball into the future is how can we get these two sides working together? Because ultimately, let's face it, there are are there some are there some bad actors on both sides of that equation? Sure. And I don't care what profession you're in. But ultimately, anybody who goes into the coaching of basketball, we hope they're in that for the right reason, which is to help kids to develop them not only as basketball players, but develop them as people. And if both sides are trying to do that and both sides communicate, we're going to end up with better results across the board, whether that's a more successful high school coach in a high school program, whether that's a more successful AU program or whether that's a more successful student athlete who has a great high school career and then is able to find the right fit at the college level. And that's Absolutely. what we're all really about. hundred percent. All right. So, so as we're coming up towards an hour and a half, I want to give you a chance to just talk about the roles that you have right now, the things that you have going on, just give people an idea of exactly what you're doing day to day right now, just so they have a, a little idea of some of the things that Absolutely. you have going so, on. So um, it's pretty much split time between two roles. Um, I'm with All Ohio Basketball, uh, Nike EYBL program. 
uh, and I work there in the um, in, on the recruiting side uh, from just identifying, evaluating, and uh, recruiting elite youth players um, from our age groups, 15, 16, 15, 16 17 U. Uh, we have youth basketball as well, but uh, that's where the bulk of my time is focused on is identifying these these players in the Ohio and in the Midwest region. Uh, so that's that's kind of you know my that's more of a passion project, if you will. Um, I left Spire in the end of December um, and, and took a role as a consultant for Coa Prep, which is based in Rockville, Maryland. Um, and the reason why I did that, once again, uh, for me, when when the money became more important than the student athlete, um, it, it was uh, a signifying moment that that wasn't the right fit or the right situation for me. Um, and I just had to trust God that he would put me in the right position moving forward and the, the best position to be able to continue to help student athletes. And, um, you know, I was blessed to, to get a phone call from the people at Coa Prep, um, you know, just asking me to help and how could I help. Uh, so I was able to go in there, there as a consultant, um, and you know I, I'm there as an executive recruiting and basketball operations consultant, where you know I come in and I look at the operations of you know from scheduling to you know what that day to day look uh, day to day process looks like for our student athletes, uh, what the development looks like for them, um, the coaching, the meals, I mean everything um, you you name it from start to finish, and and I absolutely love postgraduate basketball. Um, I, I'm a big fan of it. And the reason why I'm a big fan of it is I'm not a big fan of high school prep basketball. Um, there are some situations that I love. And, and I talked about that on Twitter the other day. Um, ISA, they're, they're a new program in Cleveland. Um, they've been, this is their second year. I absolutely love them. Um, they're scholastic. Uh, and, and that is a big, big difference maker when you're looking at prep school um, on a basketball academy that's not as much of you know academic driven or academic based versus a scholastic program that's on on an amazing campus academically and can help their their students from that regard. But um, not all prep basketball programs are built the same. Um, so that's something that I kind of you know I've, I've I've identified with years of being in the business. Um, but postgraduate is important because you have a lot of guys that are kind of on that bubble, right? Where you know maybe they're a Division one potential prospect that just didn't get enough playing time in high school or they didn't play AAU because they were that multi-sport guy that you know wasn't able to play in the summers due to playing baseball or wasn't able to play whatever the case may be um, the the NCA grants student athletes uh, a, a fifth year or a gap year if you will uh, of high school that it does not affect their college eligibility as long as they are not enrolled as a full-time student so prep programs or postgraduate programs will allow that student to get some college credits. Typically, we'll say take two courses, um, and then they'll play. You know, they'll they'll play competitive basketball against other prep level guys or postgraduate guys, um, and it's another opportunity to get seen and, and evaluated. And from my standpoint, I look at it as a win win, right? If that kid has um, Division three offers. And, you know, they're telling them, okay, hey, this is what your, your financial aid package looks like. Chances are with another year of development, you're going to get better in some way, shape, or form or fashion. Whether that mean, okay, hey, you know, we improved the, the ACT, SAT score because they took a prep course all year long and they got their score higher. So now their, their cost of, um, uh, of, of education went down. Or, hey, their game improved that much that now they went from a Division three offer to a Division two. So that investment, you can see a return on investment, um, and it's in a place where there is no alternative, right? There is no, okay, I could just go to free public high school. No, you know, yes, you could go and you could take the offer you have now, but if that's not what you're really interested in, or if you believe that there's something a step higher that you can achieve, then postgraduate's the way to go. So I absolutely love the idea of that, um, which is the reason why I'm consulting with Coa Prep. Um, so uh, I'm in Maryland. You know, I was there for the last couple of weeks, um, and then I came back. Uh, there was a, a big event flying to the hoop down in Columbus um, that, you know, I, I yearly I'm there. So I was there this year evaluating guys and showing my support to Air Horseman that does, he does an amazing job uh, with that event. Um, and I'll be in town. There's a big event in Cleveland um, coming up this weekend. Chet Mason, he does a, an amazing event. Chet Mason Invitational, that's coming up next uh, Sunday, or this coming up Sunday. So I'll be there for that. 
uh, and then I head back out to Maryland. So I'll, I'll do usually a week on, a week off, or three days on, four days off, um, and, and I kind of bounce between. But uh, for me, it's just a, an ability to A, uh, stay in, in tune with elite, high-level high school basketball with the All-Ohio side of things, and then B, be in more of a um, – of a helpful role of being able to find student athletes from all levels, whether they be NAIA bound, D3 bound, or maybe there's a division one guy that just needs some academic help um, and being able to be that resource to, to get them from point A to point B and, and hopefully have some savings and, and major return on investment um, for that postgraduate year. So those are kind of my two roles um, that, that I, I juggle uh, between also being a, a father um, and also, you know, I, on the, on the back end of that, um, I have my own business where, you know, I do, you know, recruiting seminars still, um, I, I have my book, I'm working on another book. Uh, so there's a, a million and one things I have going on at the same time. Uh, but it's all fun and it's all for, for the kids, it's all for student athletes and to be able to, um, help them, you know, reach the, the levels that I reached and then some, you know, I think that, you know, I look back on it and my greatest times, um, not just experiences, but I met some amazing people. I learned some amazing life lessons. Uh, they were learned in, in some way, shape, form, or fashion around team sports. So to be able to help facilitate that and, and help, you know, create, um, I wouldn't even say create, but, but help cultivate, uh, you know, young men, right? Um, and be able to look at, I, I had guys that I trained, you know, when I really just dove into this in 2013 that, I'm seeing now that are walking across the stage, um, you know, guys that I had as eighth graders that are walking across the stage from, from college right now and being able to know that athletics played a huge part in that, um, that's more valuable than, than a kid walking across the stage to me getting drafted, you know, knowing that this person, he earned a degree. And sometimes I'm seeing guys that they're the first person in their family to earn a college degree. And, you know, knowing that we played a part in that or I was able to in some way motivate that that student athlete to get to that point so um that's what makes the sacrifices all worth it that's what makes the sleepless nights or the long drives or the you know the weeks on end away from my family um that that's what makes it worth it for me it's all great stuff i think just based on this conversation and what little i know about you going into it and then hearing you talk tonight i i can only imagine the things that you're going to do going forward uh, just with the diversity of interest that you have, and I think it's going to be exciting to kind of follow and see where you're gonna where you're gonna end up and what you're gonna do. And you're already doing great things to help kids out there and make the basketball world a better world for everybody who's involved. And we can't thank you enough for taking the time to jump on with us, spend an hour and a half. Before we go, I want to give you a chance to share how people can reach out to you, find out more about what you're doing. So just maybe share out your contact information, where people can get in contact with you, and then I'll jump back on, wrap up the episode, and also while you're sharing your contact, if there's anything else that you know you want to hit as our final parting shot, perfect, go ahead and do perfect. that as well. All right, so the, the best way to reach me, I literally live on social media. Um, lately, I've been living in the Twitter space a little bit more than, than Instagram or anything else. Um, but I'm on all platforms on Twitter. It's Justin W. Brantley. Um, and, and that's probably the, the primary place to, to reach me or find me at. But you can find all of my socials. I'm actually launching my, um, my, my new uh, website, uh, www.thebrantleymethod.com. That'll be out um, by the time this, this goes live. I actually, I've, I've got a call with my, uh, my, my design team here as soon as we get off here to, to discuss uh, that final approval and then them hitting the, the go live button. Um, so, so nice. that, you know, that, that kind of has everything and everywhere where you need to know that I can be at, <laughs> you, you can find that's kind of the, 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 uh, that's the catch all, catch all catch right, right there. Right the there. Um, nice. and, you know, and I'll say, um, it's kind of a parting shot or a place to leave it at. Um, you know, as, as guys have seen, or as you'll, you'll see when you visit my website and people actually see it on, it's, it's literally on my business card. Um, I, I, and it's on, on my, my Twitter icon, but there's a picture of me holding a deflated basketball. And the reason why and I get questions all the time, people say, well, why are you doing that? Well, what is that about? And the reality is at some point the air is coming out of the ball 
And nobody wants to hear that while they're in the middle of it. Nobody wants to hear that while they're the sixth grade basketball player that has dreams of playing in the NBA. But the reality is at some point this is going to end for us. And what are the steps between now and then going to do to prepare us for the rest of our lives? Because we have a whole lot of life to live after the game's over for us. So um, for me, if nobody takes anything from my story or anything from you know my, my advice or, or the conversation that we had, um, I want them to begin with the end in mind, and I want them to know that at some point this is going to end for me. So, what do I want that? Want, what do I want it to look like when I look back on it? Do I want it to be, hey, I, you know, I, I didn't give my all every single day, and I regret that, and I wish I had time to redo it, or do I want it to be, hey, you know what? I love the game. I, I gave everything I had to give. I learned a ton from it. And it set me up for success in the rest of my life in other areas. So, you know, the choice is really yours. And the choice of, of what you do with the opportunity that, that God's given you, uh, that's, that, that's, that's between you and God, right? I can't tell you you're not working hard enough or you're not giving your all. Um, but you've got to look yourself in the mirror every day um, and hold yourself accountable for the work that you did or you didn't do. So the, the message that I tell all of my guys on a daily basis is we've got to get 1% better. And if you focus your energies on getting just 1% better than you were the day before, um, through, through the consistent effort and, and the consistent day-to-day -day work, you'll look up six months from now and you'll be a completely different person and different player and different young man or young woman than you were when you started this journey. And if you're a freshman listening to this and you know by the time senior year hits, you're going to be you know, noticeably better. You're going to be noticeably different because you made it your daily duty that I'm going to get better. And it doesn't mean that you've got to go from, from zero to 100, but guess what? Yesterday, you know, I, I didn't want to drool with my left hand because every time I did, I got the ball stolen from me. So today I'm going to make sure that I spend an hour just doing nothing but dribbling with my left hand, right? And that's going to get me 1%. Or I don't like left hand layups because they always, I always, whatever the case may be, focusing on, instead of gravitating towards the things that we're great at, because everybody likes to do that, but figuring out where can I get just a little bit better incrementally better and know that when it's all said and done that time and effort focused on that is what's going to be the difference between success and failure love it that's a great way to end it justin we can't thank you enough for spending an hour and a half with us it's been a pleasure to get to know you a little bit better to learn more about your journey and to dig in deep on some issues that are out there in the youth sports uh you know the youth sports environment so thank you so much for joining us and to everyone out there, we will catch you on our next Thank episode. You. Thanks. Registration is now open at headstartbasketball.com for this summer's Head Start Basketball Camps. We'll be hosting camps for boys and girls in grades 1 through 6 throughout the greater Cleveland area. Get registered today and make sure you hit the courts with us this summer. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.